The Capitalist Unconscious, Marx and Lacan, by Samuel Tomsek. This is part four of chapter two. Um, chapter two is called The Capitalist Unconscious, A Return to Freud. And part four is called Repression and Production. The reason for the impossibility of immediate satisfaction of the drive lies in Verdrangung, repression in which Freud detects another, probably the most unusual type of unconscious labor. The power which makes it difficult or impossible to enjoy disguised obscenity is termed by us repression. It is, it is our belief that culture and higher education have a large influence on the development of repression, and we suppose that under such conditions, the psychical organization undergoes an alteration as a result of which, what was formerly felt as agreeable now seems unacceptable and is rejected with all possible psychical force. The repression labor of civilization brings it about that primary possibilities of enjoyment, which have now, however, been repudiated by the censorship in us, are lost to us, but to the human psyche all renunciation is exceedingly difficult, and so we find that to tendentious jokes provide a means of undoing the renunciation and retrieving what was lost. When we laugh at a refined, obscene joke, we are laughing at the same thing that makes a peasant laugh at a coarse piece of smut. In both cases, the pleasure springs from the same source. Freud's description immediately recalls the repressive hypothesis that Foucault criticized in his work. On the one hand stands the labor of repression, which serves higher tendencies striving to preserve the cultural ideals and in institutions, and on the other, the originary yet excluded jouissance, the immediate possibilities of enjoyment, which had to be abandoned in favor of cultural progress. Cultural phenomena such as jokes creates the, impress the impression of bypassing the prohibition and regaining a part of the lost and forbidden jouissance. Is this the ultimate point Freud's theory of repression wants to make? The quoted passage certainly supports this, for Freud places the existence of the drive before culture, thereby formulating the hypothesis of a jouissance before jouissance, an originary jouissance, <laughs> which was subsequently prohibited and mortified by the intervention of the law. Freud's later theoretical endeavors try to embody this hypothetic jouissance in the mythological figure of the primordial father, but his phylogenetic speculations are marked by a complex structure which questions simplified critical readings. In Totem and Taboo, where Freud's main topic of discussion is the birth of law from the originary patricide, the primal father is evidently a personification of originary jouissance, but he is equally an instance that imposes originary prohibition. The right to jouissance belongs to him only, not to his sons, the subjects of the obscene paternal violence in which jouissance and law are indistinguishable. The primal father can stand for jouissance before jouissance only insofar as he is also a law before the law. This fusion of jouissance with the law makes him an insatiable instance, demanding renunciation from all other members of the human horde. Freud's descriptions of this prehistoric father figure, therefore, show that his two main features merely exaggerate both tendencies that were discussed in relation to jokes, violence and obscenity, violence over his sons and obscene right over all women. The primal father is literally a joke, but a joke that Freud took seriously. Far from resolving the dilemmas that pushed Freud's theories towards an epistemological deadlock, its speculative discussion merely condenses the paradoxes of the actually existing libidinal economy in one hypothetical character. Levi Strauss and Lacan already recognized in the tale of originary patricide that Freud adopted from the ethnological and evolutionary context a scientific myth. 
But in Freud's case, this myth becomes a curious structural equivalent of what Marx strived to address under primitive accumulation, a historical fiction, which strives to outline the genesis of modern antagonisms that determine both subjective and social reality. The repressive hypothesis, tempting as it may be, and the myth of the primordial father do not succeed in resolving all the imminent contradictions that Freud encounters in unconscious labor, namely that it produces pleasure gain and creates long detours that apparently sabotage immediate satisfaction. The labor of repression is split between the achievements of condensation and displacement on the one hand and those of suppression and censorship on the other. Unconscious production is conditioned by this discordance, showing that at least one segment of the repression questions its simplified understanding as a force that works from the higher mental or cultural instances, the ego and the superego on the repressed desires and drives, the id, being a productive unconscious labor and even the most general description for the variety of its achievements, repression must be dissociated from the meaning attributed to it by the repressive hypothesis, namely that of suppression and oppression. The misunderstanding is surely encouraged by Freud's initial explanations of repression, but it was strengthened through the translations of Virgin, Virgin Gung, in which notably the English and French translators heard oppression and suppression. One of the main achievements of Lacan's return to Freud consisted in reaffirming the primacy of repression in terms of productive labor over the repressed, thereby providing the necessary ground for distinguishing repression from suppression or oppression. Repression may create the conditions for oppression, but it is not its synonym. Far from being instances and institutions of repression, family and society are its products thereby assuming the same status as the repressed drives and desires. Once repression is distinguished from oppression, its productive character appears double. Freud's book on jokes already shows that repression plays the crucial role in the production of jouissance, while the later metapsychological writings argued that it also constitutes the repressed. Like alienation, repression as well is imminently doubled on constitutive and constituted repression, whereby Freud addresses the constitutive repression in the notion of Erverdrängung, originary repression. The notion certainly accentuates the transcendental character of repression, which immediately recalls the structuralist transcendentalism of the symbolic. But originary repression goes a step further because it also exposes the inherently twofold structure of repression that from the autonomy of symbolic structure deduced two produ productive achievements. Before considering the significance of repression for the encounter of psychoanalysis with Marxism, it is necessary to recall the basic accounts of Freud's theory of repression. Repression is revealed as a compromise procedure middling, intermediate thing, between escape and condemnation, which already deprives it of the exclusively negative connotation that later readings of Freud ended up privileging. It neither avoids the repressed tendency nor refuses its satisfaction. The central question is why the tendency is repressed in the first place, and the spontaneous answer would most likely be that its satisfaction would cause unpleasure. This is precisely not the case. A necessary condition of its happening must clearly be that the drive's attainment of its aim should produce unpleasure instead of pleasure. But we cannot well imagine such a, a contingency. There are no such drives. Satisfaction of a drive is always pleasurable. We should have to assume certain peculiar circumstances, some sort of process by which the pleasure of satisfaction is changed into unpleasure. Every satisfaction is lustful, full of pleasure. There is no satisfaction without the production of pleasure. In order to respond to this dilemma, the notions of the drive and of pleasure need to be questioned thoroughly. The Freudian concept of the drive remains controversial even today.
The term is adopted from the physiological and biological context, and even from mechanics, just as labor power, but it describes a phenomenon that, even if traversing the biological body, reaches beyond its limits. In the naturalistic context, the drive stands for a bodily need, which can be traced back to physiological mechanisms. Freud, accordingly, distinguishes between drives that point to a quasi-natural need, e.g. hunger and thirst. This was probably the reason why Trieb was initially translated as instinct. Where repression is out of the question and drives that deviate from this apparently natural satisfaction and are subjected to repression. In this category, Freud situated sexuality. Let us take the case in which a drive stimulus such as hunger remains unsatisfied. It then becomes imperative and can be allayed by nothing but the action that satisfies it. It keeps up a constant tension of need. Nothing in the nature of a repression seems in this case to come remotely into question. In this physiological sense, hence in relation to the preservation of organism, the drive is entirely reducible to need and cannot become the target of repression. It can be satisfied only by a corresponding action, eating, drinking, and so on. The drive that demands the labor of repression is too symbolic to be biological or physiological. This and nothing else is the meaning of Freud's claim that the drive appears to us as a concept on the frontier between the mental and the somatic, or as the psychical representative of the stimuli originating from within the organism and reaching the mind. This careful placement of the drive, neither physiological nor psychological, sufficiently indicates that Freud aims beyond the classical mind-body dualism, without therefore slipping into a vitalist monism. The drive is the border that from within traverses and splits the body on the physiological and the libidinal, so that we are dealing with some sort of conflictual monism including negativity, precisely the negativity of representation, which brings the materiality of the signifier and the causality that depends on its autonomy into the picture. As an internal border, which makes the biological equivocal with the linguistic, the drive remains a bodily phenomenon and even appears indistinguishable from the need it translates or represents. Fusing a physiological stimulus with its representation, the drive becomes a material echo of linguistic autonomy, but it, al but it is also what the intervention of the signifier isolates in the tendencies of the organism towards self-preservation. Freud's inquiries circulate around this epistemological deadlock because the echo is too material. It cannot be declared an idealist entity or a scientific fiction, but because its satisfaction seems to cause unpleasure, which is not the case with physiological needs, something violates the mechanisms of satisfaction. This scandal in the end exposes the minimal gap between the drive and organic needs. The drive is the symbolic isolation of their demand, the imperative for satisfaction that they contain. Detached from its repetitive organic context, the demand for satisfaction assumes a life of its own, and this is where the unpleasurable aspect of satisfaction enters the picture. Freud was most certainly hesitant regarding the ontological status of the drive. In his new introductory lectures, he famously wrote that the drive is comparable to a mythological being and his drive theory to ancient mythology. Certainly the drive is a hypothesis, which strives to account for the fact that the apparatus of the signifier, which conditions the split between consciousness and the unconsciousness, does not follow useful goals, the satisfaction of needs, but tends towards immediate pleasure gain. The drive names the tendency that accounts for a series of material consequences of the signifier without therefore appearing before the analyst's eyes as a positive substance. In our work, we cannot for a moment disregard them, yet we are never sure that we are seeing them clearly. The drive assumes the same ontological and epistemological status as the energy does in physics. Its hypost hypostasis is indispensable but one can never confront it directly, only observe its consequences. First and foremost, the production of pleasure gain and the conversion of pleasure into unpleasure. The visibility of the drive's satisfaction is comparable to the visibility of entropy, which can be observed only after science has placed the formal language
of mathematics over the physical world. The manifestation of physiological needs additionally blurs the visibility of the drive, or better put, because all the bodily needs are channeled through the drive as their privileged representation, they no longer remain unproblematic. The drive is the paradigmatic case of the pun traditor, tradi traditor. It represents, translates the apparently natural need in an unfaithfully productive way, thereby betraying its satisfaction. The translation first and foremost produces a change in the status of pleasure. There's no drive, the satisfaction of which would not cause pleasure, although this pleasure is no longer an affect that accompanies the decrease of tension. We can return to Marx's example of the two hungers from the Grand Reese. The pleasure that can be associated with the satisfaction of hunger is different from the pleasure that clings to the act of eating. The intertwining of the two imperatives, the need and the demand in the satisfaction of it of a physiological need conceals the fact that the demand of the drive is constant, that it repeats the imperative of satisfaction beyond the need. It would, it would be too simple to see in an insatiable hunger that swallows raw food, a pre-symbolic natural instinct, which stands opposite to the culture, cultural consumption of food. Um, bare instinctual life is an imaginary presentation of what takes place behind the apparent satisfaction of physiological needs, the persistence of the imperative beyond every attempt of satisfaction. This feature of the drive did not go unnoticed in Freud. The drive never operates as a force giving a momentary impact, but always as a constant one. The detachment of the imperative from a concrete reference and consequently the autonomy of the demand, which depends on the autonomy of the signifier, places the drive in discrepancy with every supposedly natural or instinctual need. The, the demand of the oral drive, isolated in the need for nourishment, persists behind different and apparently unrelated activities such as eating, smoking, speaking, sucking, and so on. Due to this persistence, the drive's constant force can only be experienced as unpleasure. More precisely, as oh, what the fuck, lusty necked als solch empfunden worden can, pleasure that cannot be felt as such. Pleasure that can only be experienced as unpleasure. With this formulation, Freud provides the best definition of what Lacan envisages with his notion of jouissance. In the need, displeasure precedes its satisfaction. In the drive, displeasure accompanies satisfaction and is the privileged form of pleasure. Satisfaction now takes place in the increase of tension, and this tension is due to the insatiable drang, pressure, which is common to all drives. It is, in fact, their very essence. The drive as representation of physiological needs comes down to the imperative signifier, S1, the repressed signifier of jouissance. Here, the second essential feature of the drive enters the picture, which clarifies that Marx's opposition between bare hunger and cultivated hunger indeed highlights two imminent aspects of the drive and not the opposition between nature and culture. Under constant pressure, Freud understands the amount of force or the measure of the demand for labor that it represents. At the very core of the drive stands a permanent demand for labor, representation of labor power, hence the Freudian attempt to elaborate in energetics of the drive. This demand for labor explains the simultaneous sameness and difference between pleasure and unpleasure in unconscious satisfaction. At this point, Freud's early analogy with capitalism finds another repetition. Because the unconscious is split between the capitalist and the laborer, the process of satisfaction is necessarily experienced on both ends, pleasure and unpleasure. Yet the one enjoying is not the subject, for as Freud's analyses demonstrate again and again, there is no subject of jouissance. There is only the subject of labor, the addressee of the demand for labor. There is no imperative of jouissance without the imperative of labor. Consequently, labor is true meaning of the superego's injunction in joy. <laughs> 
the critical kernel of Freud's labor theory of the unconscious again becomes striking since Marx's reformulation of the political economic labor theory of value into a materialist theory of the subject was the first one to establish this interdependency of the two demands that can be associated with capital. The constant demand for surplus value and the constant demand for labor. The difference between need and demand is finally reflected at the level of the object. Unlike need, the drive appears to be without an object. The object of a drive is the thing in regard, in regard to which or through which the drive is able to achieve its aim. It is what it is. It is what is most variable about a drive and is not originally connected with it, but becomes assigned to it only in consequence of being peculiarly fitted to make satisfaction possible. Lacan later draws attention to this passage in order to explain how the object A relates to the montage of the drive. However, we cannot overlook the fact that Freud, prior to Lacan's developments, again hints at the difference between the content and the form, which already backed the mechanism of desire. The drive reaches its satisfaction in the object form, which corresponds to the autonomy of differences, and based on this displacement, the demand for satisfaction can become imperative. The drive becomes a symbolic machine without end, consuming objects for the sake of consumption, i.e. extraction of surplus, and designating the permanent and ends the lung deformation and displacement of the need. Let us now turn to the paradoxes of repression. Freud writes that repression is not an originary defense mechanism, but can only become operative once a sharp cleavage has occurred between conscious and unconscious mental activity. Repression already presupposes the unconscious, and its function does not consist so much in suppressing, inhibiting, or hindering satisfaction but in keeping the drive away from consciousness. The paradox of repression lies in the fact that repression is secondary, despite being constitutive of the repressed. It can only emerge after the scission of the mental apparatus between consciousness and the unconscious has been established, but it is also the necessary condition for this cleavage. The hypothesis of an originary repression is supposed to solve the paradox and the relation between the repression and the repressed. We have reason to assume that there is an originary repression, a first phase of repression, which consists in the psychical, ideational representative of the drive being denied entrance into the conscious. With this fixation, with this fixation is established, the representative in question persists unaltered from then onwards, and the drive remains attached to it. What is repressed is not some originary instinctual substance that the intervention of language would suppress, but the signifier of the drive, a signifier that aims at jouissance, and on which the translation of the supposedly physiological need into the symbolic demands depend, demand depends. Freud again recurs to the more accessible language of the repressive hypothesis, but in fact targets the autonomy of the signifier. The actual achievement of originary repression is the production of the master signifier, which is synonymous to the autonomy of the system of differences, a signifier of the demand and jouissance. The originary repression thus confronts an impossible task to examine the repressed in statu nascendi, the genesis of the repressed, which is, in the last instance, the same as the genesis of language. The description of the structure of repression continues in the following way. The second stage of repression, repression proper, affects mental derivatives of the repressed representative, or such trains of thought as, originating elsewhere, have come into associative connection with it. On account of this association, these ideas experience the same fate as what was originally repressed. Repression proper, therefore, is actually an afterpressure. Moreover, it is a mistake to emphasize only the repulsion, which operates from the direction of the conscious upon what is to be repressed. Quite as important is the attraction exercised by what was originally repressed upon everything with which it can establish a connection. Probably the trend towards repression would fail in its purpose if these two forces did not cooperate, if there were not something previously repressed ready to receive what is repelled by the conscious. Constituted repression, the second stage of repression, is productive 
unconscious labor. All other forms of unconscious labor can be reduced to, repre to repression, which now appears as the satisfaction of the drive rather than its suppression or obstruction. Here another complication emerges. We are not simply dealing with two different repressions, of which one would be in the past and the other in the present. The historical reading overlooks the topological aspect of repression that is linked to its inherent doubling. In order to have repression, there have to be at least two. A singular repression could not constitute the relation that Freud very precisely describes in reference to attraction and repulsion. The inner moments of every concrete act of repression are originally repression, the constitution of the repressed and the labor of repression, the satisfaction of the repressed tendency. This double structure can be compared with the chain of signifiers. The cut that produces the split between consciousness and the unconscious is redoubled as the signifier of the, the, of the repressed demand for surplus jouissance, S1A, and as a difference that relates to another signifier, S1, S2. Initiating unconscious production and representing the amount of demand for labor, labor power. Repression activity contains both axes of the signifier, representation, and production. This internal doubling unveils the parallax that Freud explicitly underlines in the reminder that besides the repulsion from consciousness, one should equally acknowledge the attraction that derives from the point of the originary repression, the master signifier. From the point of view of consciousness, repression appears as a defense mechanism that represses in the sense of oppression. The repressive hypothesis absolutizes this perspective, and we can find its most contemporary political exemplification in neoliberalism. Did the neoliberal ideology not turn around the idea that the market contains creative potentials, which need to be liberated through deregulation? The concept of the free market mobilizes the repressive hypothesis, through which capitalism perverts and neutralizes the political radicality of modern liberation movements. Only from the position of the subject, which is the position of Freud's labor theory of the unconscious and Marx's critique of fetishism, can repression appear as an operation that conditions the satisfaction of the drive through the double production of the surplus object and of the alienated subject in a concrete form. The drive now no longer appears deprived of its immediate satisfaction. Repulsion, rejection, turns into attraction, satisfaction and unpleasure turns into a specific form of pleasure. This problematic is not unrelated to Marx, for in the double structure of repression, Freud encounters the same problem that concerns the accumulation of capital. When Marx turns towards the historical conditions of capitalism, he reformulates the question of primitive accumulation, which served classical political economy in its apology for capitalism. Marx unveils its fictional character, but then also provides its rational reinterpretation in the context of the historical genesis of the capitalist logic. The transformation of the old spirit of the miser into the modern spirit of capitalism, which deepened the social relations of domination by rooting them in the very relations between things. The modern reification of the master, i.e. its detachment from the old figure of divine sovereign, inevitably brought about the reification of the subject. The psychoanalytic value of Marx's speculation on the origins of capitalism consists in him exposing the links between jouissance and ideology, and more concretely, the rootedness of economic liberalism in the fiction of the subject of enjoyment, a fiction which remains entirely intact in today's neoliberal condition. Of course, the significance of primitive accumulation is commonly known and has been discussed by several authors. Marx starts from the structural paradox in the relation between accumulation and production, just as in the case of repression and the repressed, where repression constitutes the repressed that it simultaneously presupposes. The analysis of accumulation contains a vicious circle in which production and accumulation support each other. There is no accumulation of capital without a preceding production of surplus, but there is no production of surplus without the preceding accumulation of capital either. Marx first draws attention to the fact that primitive accumulation as used in political economy contains a moral lesson, 
thereby assuming the role of original sin in theology. It thereby also assumes the function of myth, since it strives to address the unattainable historical origin of accumulation of capital, a point that can be grasped only by means of fictitious constructions and fantasies. The tale is grounded on the presupposition of jouissance on the side of the proto-proletarian and the equally presupposed renunciation on the side of the proto-capitalist. Long ago, there were two sorts of people. One, the diligent, intelligent, and above all, frugal elite. The other, lazy rascals, or lumpen, spending their substance and more in riotous living. Thus, it came to pass that the former sort accumulated wealth, and the latter sort finally had nothing to sell except their own skins. And from this original sin dates the poverty of the great majority who, despite all their labor, have up to now nothing to sell but themselves and the wealth of the few that increases constantly, although they have long ceased to work. At the beginning, there were the ascetic and the consumer, the subject of renunciation and the subject of enjoyment. The political economic myth thus tries to explain the genesis of positive and negative surplus. Surplus value originating from abstinence and embodied in the first accumulated wealth and labor power originating from excess, for which the myth for which the myth claims that it inevitably generates debt. Abstinence helps accumulating the surplus that will finally enable the minority to appropriate the means of production, while jouissance creates a negative that will eventually force the majority to sell their own bodies. For political economy this scenario sounds entirely rational. The capitalist forefathers accumulated the minimal wealth through personal sacrifice, so it seems just that their contemporary offspring continue to profit from it without restriction. At the same time, the proletarians are responsible for their own misery because their predecessors wasted more than they possessed. Ihr alles und mehr. This apparently insignificant formulation is crucial because it envisages the interdependency of jouissance and debt, seemingly adopted from religion, hence Marx's comparison of primitive accumulation with the fable of original sin. The political economic myth significantly marked recent attempts to legitimize austerity measures, as others have already noticed. The Global South was was presented as the space of enjoying subjects that the absurd national debts meanwhile turned into an oasis of surplus population, while its counterpart, the global north, and notably Germany, appeared as the land of saving, a success story possible only under the condition that the economic growth is anchored in the constant renunciation of jouissance. Of course, everyone could witness that the actual situation was quite the opposite. Imposed saving initiates a negative spiral that produces more debt than is possible to repay. This debt is not a moral obligation calling for repayment, but actually has a productive function. The austerity measures are supposed to create economic devastation that will strengthen the link between citizens and the structural function of indebted subject. This recent development once again confirms the thesis that the primitive accumulation is not a process in the past, but an inner moment of the present that reproduces the conditions of possibility for capitalist accumulation and expropriation. It designates the root of the discursive process that constitutes the individual as a subject of value. Just as originary repression addresses the root of the autonomy of the signifier, through which the double production of the subject of the unconscious and of surplus jouissance can be initiated. The the scission between consciousness and the unconscious is the Freudian way of addressing this autonomy. According to the According to the implicit prejudice of the political economic tale, the laborer continues to enjoy, to laze around and become even more indebted, while the capitalist continues to save, to increase his wealth. Marx introduces a minimal correction to this scenario. The capitalist subject most certainly is in the first instance a subject of debt, but never enjoyed as a subject. In other words, the capitalist figure of subjectivity did not emerge from the transformation of some hypothetical subject of jouissance into labor power, as political economists suggest, but from a specific transformation of jouissance itself.
The abstinence theory of the capitalist highlights this development. Accumulate, accumulate, that is Moses and the prophets. Industry furnishes the material which saving accumulates. Therefore save, save, i.e. reconvert the greatest possible portion of surplus value or surplus product in, into capital. Accumulation for the sake of accumulation, production for the sake of production. This was the formula in which classical economics expressed the historical mission of the bourgeoisie in the period of its domination. If in the eyes of classical economics, the proletarian is merely a machine for the production of surplus value, the capitalist too is merely a machine for the transformation of this surplus value into surplus capital. Marx's correction concerns the externalization of the link between accumulation and saving that already existed in the pre-modern spirit of the miser. In the foundation of the system lies the imperative of abstinence, which is directly translatable in the imperative of indebting. The subject's duty is to assume and to interiorize the debt created by the jouissance of the system. And precisely for this reason, Marx remarks that the national debt is the only wealth that enters into possession of all modern nations, i.e. something that belongs to everyone and from which no one has the right to exempt him or herself. While merely a minority personifies systemic jouissance, labor power becomes the sole universal subjective position in the capitalist universe. The political economic tale of primitive accumulation contains a grain of distorted truth, showing that no jouissance precedes renunciation, but that there is a strong correlation between the renunciation and the production of jouissance, both through generalized indebting. After, the criti after criticizing the political economic myth of origin, Marx suggests his own rationalized variant of primitive accumulation. In the reconstruction, which assumes no less than the status of a historiographical fiction, the separation of producers from the means of production is accomplished through blood and fire. The constitutive violence that progressively transforms the feudal relations of domination and subjection into the capitalist ones. I am not going to go deeper into Marx's reconstruction of the genesis of capitalism, the accuracy and the general validity of which remains a topic of discussion. What is more important is the logical background of Marx's outline of the historical genesis of capitalism, which in many respects anticipates Freud's topological account of repression. In Marx's reading, the crucial part in the genesis is attributed to the invention of national debt. He places the emphasis on the transformation of pre-modern religious debt, still embedded in its mystifying metaphysical meaning, into modern debt, founded on public credit and turned into a quantified and meaningless abstraction. This shift is accomplished through the transformation of the logic that grounded the feudal social link, what Lacan called the master's discourse. The starting point of the development that gave rise both to the wage laborer and to the capitalist was the enslavement of the worker. The advance made consisted in a change in the form of the servitude and the transformation of feudal exploitation into capitalist exploitation. The formal change invents a new form of indebtedness that no longer has economic metaphysical roots in submission to the feudal lord, the monarch, or any other representative of divine power on earth, but instead in the economic inequality that is codified in the apparently unproblematic and concrete act of exchange. The truth of the capitalist worldview is universal indebtedness produced by emptied political categories such as freedom and equality. The invention and social implementation of national debt and public credit amounted to a new discursive production without abolishing the old structure of domination and inequality. It merely transformed the pre-modern serf into abstract labor power, a machine to produce surplus value and in the same move introduced a new figure of the master, the capitalist, who personifies the machine to transform the surplus product into capital. This transformation integrates the surplus product into the social link, introducing a new form of fetishization of social relations through the fetishization of objects. In the same move, the feudal master is stripped of his fetish quality, which also means that the new capitalist master no longer depends on, con on concrete personifications. Mastery becomes an abstraction embodied and operative in every object that enters the economic sphere.
commodity, money, and financial abstractions. If the king had two bodies, the mortal and the sublime, the capitalist has merely one, but is therefore endowed, as Marx claims, with the soul of capital. In capitalism, the subject is indebted to neither the secular nor the divine master, but to the economic system itself. Consequently, capitalism is no realization of the spirit of Prot Protestantism, as Max Weber argued, but a cult of indebting, as Walter Benjamin specified in his famous critical note. If we want to maintain the link between capitalism and religious logic, this still makes sense because of the structural function of debt which in both cases builds on the equivocity of morality and economy, we nevertheless have to take into account a certain regression in religion. From institutionalized religion of revelation to the no less institutionalized through central banks, corporations, multinationals, political troikas, and so on, cult. Mark, Marx aims at this regression when he reduces the capitalist social link to commodity fetishism, from religion that understands itself as a religion of truth and that essentially is a true true religion into neo-paganism and rational secularized belief in the self-valorizing power of capital. But the transformation of the master into an abstraction, the abstract debt no longer grounds the social link between the master and the serf, but instead supports that between the citizen and the state. The system of public credit, i.e. of national debts, the origins of which are to be found in Genoa and Venice as early as the Middle Ages, took possession of Europe as a whole. The national debt, i.e. the externalization of the state, whether that state is despotic, constitutional, or republican, marked the capitalistic era with its stamp. The only part of the so-called national wealth that actually enters into the, into the collective possession of modern people is the national debt. Hence, as a necessary consequence, the modern doctrine that, na that a nation becomes the richer, the more deeply it is in debt. Public credit becomes the credo of capital, and with the rise of national debt making, lack of faith in the national debt takes the place of the sin against the Holy Ghost, for which there is no forgiveness. With the genesis of the national debt, Marx's analysis of primitive accumulation most definitely changes its character. While the description of the constitutive violence over the English rural population remained in imaginary historical coordinates and in the horizon of repressive hypothesis, just as Freud's early accounts of repression, the focus on national debt turns towards the logical displacement in the social mode of production, which inevitably comprises the production of labor power as a specifically capitalist form of subjectivity. The sole subject that corresponds to the regime of abstract debt and to the modern credit system. The invention of national debt and the corresponding production of subjectivity expose the kernel of the capitalist form of alienation that Marx indicates in the term externalization of the state. The capitalist state simply is an institutionalized form of a more underlying constitutive alienation, which determines the logical relation between economic abstractions, capital and labor power. The externalization of the state in the national debt is accompanied by its internalization in the sense that it shapes the nature of modern subjectivity, being essentially grounded on indebting and standing for national debt as such. The modern state places every citizen in the position of the debtor, while the position of the creditor is assumed by the social institutions of capital, the central banks. At this point, it becomes most evident that the emergence of the modern state is inevitably accompanied by the genesis of an extra state power, which pertains to financial institutions and which is essentially authoritarian. The equivalent of the placement of the citizen in the position of the debtor is the transformation of the subject into a quantifiable and exploitable subjectivity, which is indebted in advance and is also produced as such. In this way, Marx rejects the phantasmatic projection of some hypothetical subject of jouissance before the subject of abstract debt. His rationalization of the political economic myth shows that the capitalist demystification and quantification of the pre-modern religious debt creates a more efficient abstract universality, national debt, which leaves no subject outside its reach, thereby introducing a new Holy Spirit, 
that is a social link grounded on the negative spiral of productive indebting, out of which rises the spectrality and apparent autonomy of capital. To repeat what is at stake in Marx's rationalized variant of primitive accumulation is the problem of constitutive alienation, on the level of which the production of capitalist subjectivity can be observed. Abstract debt and abstract labor thereby become two inseparable aspects of the subject. And because the structure of the capitalist mode of production is internally doubled, the critical appropriation and rationalization of the notion of primitive accumulation indeed shows features that are strictly homo homologous, homologous to the Freudian notion of originary repression, where the production of constitutively alienated subjectivity is no less central. Even if Marx and Freud might have taken the notion of origin literally, they still drew attention to a structural and temporal paradox, which undermines the linear representation of history thanks to the notion of retroactive causality. Consequently, the prehistorical origin in question turns out to be more a prehistory within the present, ret retroactively projected onto the past and operating within the present condition as a constant refoundation of the capitalist relations of production. Behind the apparent quest for historical origin, Marx and Freud raised the logical and materialist question of the cause, which brought the indebted subject and the subject of the unconscious into being. The paradoxical relation between accumulation and production, which supports the structure and the efficiency of capitalism, might indeed make this mode of production a vicious circle from which no escape seems to be possible. At the same time, this paradox is also the reason of its structural disclosure and permanent instability, which announced the opposite appearance, the imminent breakdown of the system. The conceptual couple of the fetish and the symptom, shared by critique of political economy and psychoanalysis, addresses precisely these two opposite appearances of capitalism.